Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Venture Stories by Village Global. I'm here today rejoined by a very special guest and fan favorite, Byrne Hobart, back for round three. Uh, Byrne, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, as always. Since we've recorded uh, two great podcasts, uh, Byrne has launched a, a, a newsletter called The Diff, diff.substack.com, that I'm a daily reader of. And uh, if you're a fan of Stratechery, I think you will, you will love it. So it goes into technology and finance, and it's, and it's fantastic. So, so Byrne, thank you for doing that. We had a pod, two podcasts in the pre-COVID era. It feels like years ago, but it's just been uh, you know a couple months. Uh, we discussed the roles of institutions and, and their future. How have the few months, uh, past few months, changed our understanding of institutions? You know, trust seems to be at all-time lows. At the same time, we're relying on them more so than ever before. Uh, you know, government to solve the crises going on as it relates to oil, COVID, uh, et cetera. Uh, how do we make sense of this? Yeah, so one way to look at it is that um, the absolute level of trust is way, way down, but that also means that uh, people, there's a lot more demand for trust. So people are trying to find some institution they can rely on, even though they trust it a lot less than they did in, uh, in December, it's still the best that they've got. And you can actually extend that analogy to things like the dollar, where you can say that at one level, if you said there is huge disruption in the production of goods, which in theory would lead to a higher price for those goods, just more dollars chasing fewer goods. And we have this huge injection of liquidity, so even more dollars chasing this constrained set of goods that in theory, the dollar should be doing a lot worse. And in practice, people really wanna have dollars in part because it is the safest asset. Like everything, if it fluctuates in value, it fluctuates in dollar terms. So the dollar is by definition, the one thing that isn't going to fluctuate in its own terms. And then also that, um, that people have this sh- implicit short position, either either directly because they have uh, borrowed money to buy assets or indirectly in the sense that since you measure your economic returns in dollars pretty much wherever you are, like even if you live in a country that doesn't use dollars, um, the dollar is kind of the, the global yardstick for for value and for spending power. So in that sense, there's a, there's a sort of sunk cost dynamic where people, people still wanna have dollars because they trust the dollar less, but they trust everything else even less than that. Is this a win for modern monetary theorists? <laughs> how, do we, how do we make sense, who are the winners here? How do we make sense of, uh, of what's happening with uh, Yeah. So it's, a, it's definitely an interesting test of MMT. So it's like, there's the lame folk version of MMT, which is just deficits never matter. And that's actually not what the MMT people say. What they say is that the constraint on government spending is not a lack of dollars. It's not like the question, how does the government pay for this, is always answered by the government spends money because the government has an unlimited ability to spend dollars. The question, the real constraint is real resources. So um, that, that means that you can actually, you can have positive and negative versions of MMT. So the positive version of MMT, the optimistic one, is um, the U.S. debt is really zero because we could print up enough dollars to pay off every treasury tomorrow. But then the negative interpretation is, okay, the U.S. debt is not real. It's um, that, that can just be printed away. But the, uh, the non, non-dollar denominated, or the, um, the, the off-balance sheet liabilities, so Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Those are, in fact, real liabilities. And as it turns out, we don't have a good measure of them because if the implicit implicit view of Medicare and Medicaid is that we should have some some government backstop for a large and growing share of healthcare expenditure, if the amount of healthcare that we need starts to go up, then the size of that liability is even bigger. So um, the... The cruel version of MMT is you can print as many dollars as you want. You can't print doctors, you can't print masks, and you can't print ventilators. So that means that if you do engage in a lot of money printing, you have to calibrate it pretty carefully so that you do get more of what you actually want. And also so that you avoid the deflationary effects of nobody can pay their rent. So nobody who owns an apartment complex can uh, can pay their mortgage. So the banks start going under. So they start calling in other loans. So the entire economy just 
the um, the balance sheets are so impaired that the economy collapses. Like that's that's the fundamental problem that uh, a lot of these interventions are trying to solve, and that is the big problem. And um, a bit later, we can get into why the mechanisms for solving that problem work the way they do. So who benefits, who doesn't benefit, and uh, why that is. Let's get into that right now. All right, let's do it. So um, the first the first part of the federal government to really react to COVID-19, or at least to react to the economic consequences, was the Fed. And um, they did their, their weekend intervention, really dramatic rate cut, and then they started buying more assets, they started lending against more assets, um, and they kept on rolling out new programs. One of the really interesting ones actually is um, that they started backstopping short-term debt issued by municipal borrowers. So that would include city and state governments. And um, what that actually means is that they are monetizing the debt of states and cities. And one of the, one of the fiscal problems that the US sometimes faces is that those entities have a lot of trouble running deficits. Like they don't actually have the money printer, it can't go burr. So um, they can actually go into a deflationary collapse that the US government at a federal level would be able to avoid. So in some sense, the Fed is doing a really good job of plugging into some parts of the economy that need help. But the Fed is also limited in the sense that it can do a lot with big banks. It can do a lot with open market operations, but what it can't do is it can't send money to you and it can't send money to um, your favorite local restaurant or your favorite local coffee shop. It's just not equipped to do that. So we've had to sort of outsource that. We've also had to make that more of a piece of fiscal policy where we basically had this um, extremely roided up version of the SBA and uh, that's been extending a lot of loans, um, a whole lot of loans. But again, the, the institutions that are really good at getting those loans are not necessarily the ones that are the most stressed. They're just the ones with the best relationships with their bankers. And, um, and that tends to be either a, companies that are actually fairly large, or B, companies that do a lot of their, um, manage a lot of their financials through fintech platforms that are really quickly spinning up solutions to this. Um, so one way to look at the fintech side of things is that right now we're running a war economy in reverse, where normally in a war economy what happens is the government will go to major manufacturers and tell them, congratulations, you're now in the tank business. And they'll say, well, I thought I made Fords and Chevys, and the government will say, nope, you actually make tanks and bombers. But now we're doing it in the opposite direction, where we are, um, we're taking the SBA and we're saying, actually, SBA is um, just one more product line that, um, that Square does for user acquisition, or that a challenger bank does to, uh, to also acquire users and help their customers. So we are, um, we are in that sense playing to our strengths but there are still going to be companies that fall through the cracks. And um, a lot of them are going to be very small businesses and um, people who just haven't heard of Square and haven't heard of these FinTech platforms. So that's actually gonna be a really tough political challenge because there isn't any good um, infrastructure for getting money to those people. And then when you look at the other part of the fiscal equation, which is improving unemployment benefits, that's also incredibly challenging because that's been done on a national scale, but wages vary a whole lot uh, between states and then within states um, by city versus rural. So you end up with a case where um, the a lot of employees of small businesses in places with a low cost of living would really prefer to be laid off right now. So um, that that turns this unemployment benefit from basically a way to make sure that um, that we avoid it turns from a way to avoid the deflationary effect of, okay, nobody can service their debts, so the debts all go bad, so the banks all go under, to this weird inflationary thing where more money is in the hands of people who need it, but also it, it, that's conditional on those people not continuing to work. So um, it's more money and lower output. So it's going to cause this really weird, uneven, kind of spiky inflation for a while, where you'll see, you'll see inflation in... Um, in some consumer goods, you'll see extreme deflation in other consumer goods. You'll probably see deflation in asset prices and um, in especially things like real estate and within real estate, especially in, uh, in most big cities, but also also in other places where, uh, where people are more levered and are being forced to liquidate. So it'll have really uneven effects. That said, um, if you go back to who acted first and why, the Fed was the first institution to intervene because 
they're very streamlined, um, very non-democratic, very, they're consensus oriented, but it's a consensus of a handful of people who all spend all of their time thinking about and talking about macroeconomics. So those are the people you want in charge in a crisis. Um, and that is typically what happens at a crisis is that you end up with much stronger executive powers, much weaker legislative powers. In this case, the, the strong executive is Jerome Powell and um, Trump is doing other things. But um, the, the Fed did act quickly and um, the Fed does know how things played out in the last crisis where we had credit problems in subprime that actually led to funding problems throughout the banking system. And that exacerbated the crash. And then you have the negative wealth effect of every asset price is going down, so consumption is going down, so unemployment goes up, and then the whole process repeats. And um, I think the consensus among central bankers is that you can't avoid recessions, but you can avoid financial crises of that nature. You can avoid funding crises if you have a money printer. So that is, I think, what they are trying to do, and they can hopefully calibrate that in both directions. So hopefully if we start to actually see the CPI spike significantly and we can figure out that that's driven by the availability of, uh, of money from the Fed, then, then they'll dial that back significantly. Whereas if the CPI spikes because there are companies shutting down and people still have money to spend, so you have more dollars chasing fewer goods, a classic version of inflation, then it's a lot harder for the Fed to intervene. And that's something where we, they can sort of, they can mitigate the effects in the aggregate, but they can't mitigate the effects at the levels of individual products and supply chains. Supply chains are very hard. Yeah. As we're learning. It's interesting. The money printer go burr meme seems to, they seem to mean it as sort of an insult. And yet I wonder if they're sort of, you know, if the other side is sort of reclaiming it, like, yes, so what? <laughs> it goes burr uh, and, it, and it's working. I mean, in the, on the flip side of the MMT sort of side, is this a loss for, uh, for, the, for Bitcoin uh, or, or Bitcoin maximalists or sort of um, people who sort of see the, the Fed as a, um, or the, the, the printer as sort of a, a huge liability? Um, how, do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, so the way I think about that is that when you have a deflationary cycle, when people are delevering, the assets that go down the most are the ones that are borrowed against the most. And the assets that perform the best are things that are either cash or equivalent to cash. So treasuries, T-bills, but even treasuries had some, some issues earlier. And since um, there are a lot of levered holders of Bitcoin and there are really no Bitcoin denominated debts, the, the people who were forced to sell or the people who were forced to trade were all forced to sell. And nobody was really forced to buy the way you're forced to buy dollars if you're levered and your assets go down and whoever gave you that margin tells you they want the money. So in that sense, it's not, it's not the kind of crisis that demonstrates whether or not Bitcoin is a good safe haven asset. If you're thinking longer term and you do expect that it'll be really hard to calibrate the increase in money supply, that it will eventually flow through to the consumer, that it will cause a rise in general price levels, but that the, the Fed or other policymakers don't want a case where parts of the economy are going through a deflationary spiral and other parts are are doing okay. Like it may be that they want to have no deflationary spirals anywhere. So they print a lot of money, but that means really rapid inflation in some places. I'm not entirely clear where those places would be, but in some places you'd see really rapid inflation. And they may just decide that the price of making sure that we don't have a huge foreclosure wave is that we have higher inflation for a while. And and so the um, you, we just sort of detailed the the responses by you know uh, in terms of fiscal policy and, and monetary policy. Do, do you rate our responses pr pretty highly, or what would you have edited uh, or, or done differently or done instead if you uh, if you you were the ones controlling the, the levers? So I would say that on the monetary side, they did um, very well with the tools that they have. Um, the hope there is that they will be just as prudent and effective at pulling back. And if you look at the, the post great financial crisis period, there was a long period where that was the debate is, when do they slow down? How fast do they slow down? Can they slow down? Can they slowly um, shrink their balance sheet? And um, we sort of didn't get to the point where that was ever resolved before we had another crisis and another huge round of stimulus, uh, or of, of monetary stimulus. So. In that sense, that part is um, is unresolved on the monetary side. I think um, they they did fine given that they have a limited toolkit, and they were actually surprisingly aggressive at rolling out new things. And I think um, going back to the the muni debt piece of that, 
that is really important because a lot of cities are feeling immediate financial stress. Like they literally have cash in the bank and the balance is going down because nobody is paying sales taxes and a lot of people will not be able to pay the, the taxes they owe in, in for other things that are more in a lag. So those, those parts of the country are actually really financially stressed. And if they can get capital, if they can get cash, then uh, they will be in a much better position to take necessary and prudent actions on the public health side. On the fiscal side, um, it's, it's tricky again, because I do think the unemployment piece was somewhat miscalibrated, but it's also really hard to come up with a politically tenable and equitable solution. Like ideally what you'd want is some kind of really steep negative income tax, but also paid every two weeks like a paycheck. So it's not like you tell people work really hard right now and sometime after April 15th, 2021, you will get a giant check. It has to be that the cash in your pocket is higher if you keep working than if you quit your job, but that if you lose your job, you can still pay most of your bills and perhaps negotiate some of the rest. So that part I think was um, was not done in the ideal way, but maybe maybe there's not a near possible world where the negotiations actually went that much better. What, it, what all of this points to though is that we did not have the infrastructure to handle this problem at least on the fiscal side, the way that we should have. So ideally, um, ideally there'd be some way for, for us to use actual helicopter money. So just giving everyone direct deposits immediately, unconditionally. Some of that would go to rich people, some of that would go to people who didn't really need it, some of that would go to people who are actually working more overtime than they ever have in their lives. But you can always raise marginal tax rates like 1%, the top marginal tax rate is 1% next year and claw a lot of that excess money back. It's really not a super hard problem. And it does seem like inequality is not the pressing concern when you're trying to avoid both the Black Death and the Great Depression at the same time. Like it is, it is okay if there's a temporary, if there's temporary wonkiness in income inequality as a result of making both of those problems a lot smaller than they potentially could be. Yeah. So really, we, um, it's, it's sort of like, um, given that they started solving the problem in uh, really March, they did an okay job given the circumstances, but what you'd want is for them to have started thinking about this general scope of problem 10 or 20 years ago updating a lot of back-end systems so that they can handle this, like updating the, the state's unemployment um, back-end, updating the site, making sure the site can actually handle heavy load, and making sure that there's some way for the government to get money directly to individuals quickly. In our last podcast, we were talking about state capacity. And, and you know, uh, sort of, it's funny how it's been put to test and, and we've learned a lot, you know, it, it just since uh, in a very short period of time. Where is that conversation right now about state capacity? You know, we, we saw, Biology tweet out and Molebug wrote a post about how it's not that we have a bad government, we actually don't have a government at all or something like there's no actually functioning government. What are they sort of getting at or what are the learnings of, of, of what we learned about state capacity here and uh, elsewhere? Yeah, so there's, there's always that question of how much of the world is completely on autopilot. And you see that in a lot of big, old established institutions. Like there are big companies where you you cannot figure out who's in charge. Like it takes multiple meetings to find out who you should be talking to about how to solve some problem. And then you have to lobby to get it on someone's agenda. It has to work its way all the way up one part of the, uh, the org chart and then all the way back down another part of the org chart. So um, in some sense, a lot of companies are like that. They're just zombie companies sort of run on autopilot and it's, it's a really hard problem to fix. Um, it's clear that there are pockets of this country where there are some people in charge, some people who have high agency and are actually acting quickly, but it seems like either the tech and finance industries have strongly selected for those people, so that's where they all went, or that the public sector has strongly selected against them, so that's what they all left. And there are a lot of people, if you look at their resumes, where they spent two years in DC working in some really prominent sounding job and then the next 20, 10 or 20 years at BlackRock or at um, Microsoft or something like that. So it seems like a lot of pretty competent people get burned out on working for the government. And, um, and then you have people who cycle in, but the, the story with a lot of people who go from 
working at a company like Goldman to working at the, the Treasury Department or working somewhere else in the executive branch is that they get frustrated because they can't get stuff done because there's a whole set of procedures and policies and they can't fire anyone and they're really used to being able to do that or at least having the implicit threat of if you don't do this, you get fired. Whereas it seems like it's it's actually pretty hard to get fired from a job at the federal government. The what do we make about the the stock market? Uh, how do we make sense of, of what's happening there? I, I had one friend who said that maybe the stock market is the new, uh, or, uh, or maybe the S and P is the new savings account in terms of you know interest rates being so so low and QE. Uh, how do we make some sense of what what's happening in, in the stock market? Yeah, so I, I think it actually comes back to the institutional capacity question in two ways. One of which is um, what we mentioned earlier with the Fed, where the the places where they can intervene are very closely connected to or are part of the capital markets. And um, there's a sense in which a lot of the money that has ultimately flowed to equities has been the result of central bank policies in the U.S. and elsewhere, that if rates are very low and, um, and risk-free assets are impossible to buy at positive yields, as has been the case in um, a lot of Europe and Japan for uh, you know, in Europe more recently and then in Japan for a long time, when they reach for yield, they end up going to the U.S. And then when they look for something with a decent yield, decent risk reward, they end up looking at U.S. corporate debt as really the only thing with a positive yield. So you have different countries that have accumulated a lot of um, U.S. corporate debt on their balance sheets. There are little Japanese banks that have been socking away money for decades and decades and decades, they have huge balance sheets and a lot of it is in directly or indirectly lending to US corporates. And then um, you have Taiwan where they own, uh, the Taiwanese life insurers own a huge fraction of the US corporate bond market. Um, it, again, because there's there's nothing that yields Taiwan dollars that, uh, that also has a decent yield. So they, the money has to go somewhere and that's where it goes. And then what do US corporate borrowers do with this cheap capital? In a lot of cases, they don't have good places to expand to. Um, they, they don't have a lot of places where they can put a lot of capital work, but they can buy back stock. And as long as the economy is growing and as long as it's getting more stable, as long as we know that the Fed has introduced a lot of macroprudential strategies that will keep things from accelerating or decelerating too fast, and as long as we also think the US is generally a good place to do business, um, generally a um, corporation-friendly environment and a large corporation-friendly environment in particular, then it's a good risk reward to, to buy back stock. And that is, um, on net, that's basically who buys back stock, is, or who buys stock is basically corporations buy back their own stock. Um, other flows are, are not really positive and certainly not cumulatively positive in the same way. So in that sense, you can say that we're, we're still back to where we were. The money has to go somewhere. There's a lot more of it. So it eventually finds its way to large cap stocks and that you should get ahead of that. And then the other piece of institutional confidence is to ask who is actually positioned to come out of this crisis much stronger. And if you made a list of what traits would make an institution able to do that, one of them might be that it's global. So wherever recovers first, they could focus their resources there. One might be that it's physically decentralized or decentralizable. So any company where everyone can work from home and spend their time on Zoom instead of in conference rooms, that means they could keep working during a crisis. You'd also say that it's um, companies that have some, com or institutions that have some combination of a lot of cash stored up and a lot more money coming in than going out. So high margin companies with huge cash balances. So if you made that list, you basically say that you were describing um, Apple to a large extent, um, Amazon to a large extent, and especially Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Netflix, these companies, um, they are basically built for a world like this or much more built for a world like this than companies that have hard assets and have to actually send people to those assets and get customers to walk to those assets to make purchases. So in that sense, you can say that what's part of what's going on is that there's this, um, there's this wealth transfer of uncertain impact, but there's a power and influence transfer that goes to large companies. And then you can work your way down from these large cap tech companies, which are a, in a breed of their own collectively, and also individually very distinct companies, that they all have some kind of monopoly or combination of monopolies in different areas, but the story for every one of those companies is very different, because if they, if they had the same story, it wouldn't be a monopoly. So this is, this is basically riffing off of zero to one just um, half a decade later. So, so with those companies, 
you can you can easily say that they will they will be long term more influential and um, presumably more profitable off of that. And then, if you look at companies that are in um, the retail space, manufacturing space, financial space, etc., it also looks like large companies probably have an advantage. So. Um, Small businesses like restaurants, bars, coffee shops, they, they are run um, very, uh, with a lot of operating leverage, so they, their profits go negative very quickly if revenue drops, and they don't have a lot of cash on hand because it's the owner owns it and that's their income. So those companies can go under very, very quickly unless we intervene. And if there is an empty storefront where there used to be a neighborhood pizzeria, maybe Pizza Hut buys it and now it's a Pizza Hut. Same for the neighborhood coffee shop and Starbucks. So you can you could see a lot of independent retail assets getting corporatized at very advantageous prices for those corporations. And those companies, because they have access to capital markets, they have the implicit um, Fed back, backstop for buyers of their debt, they can actually source enough capital to do this if investors buy into that thesis. So then you can work your way to this sort of um, competent institution um, class war dynamic where we, we have this group of people in various industries who are actually very smart and hardworking, but don't have exactly the same set of interests as everybody else, but they are going to do what is to their advantage. And if that's what we see, if, um, if a year from now you, you walk around your neighborhood and you see a lot more Chase and Starbucks and Burger King signs and um, you, you look at those buildings and know that that's where the neighborhood business used to be, you might get pretty freaked out and disturbed. And that'll be an interesting political dynamic, not, not in this election cycle, but I think it'll be the big story in 2024. And the question, the question to answer is, um, what does Josh Hawley think we should do about all of this? Um, whoever wins in 2020 is not going to be running in 2024. So um, it, it's an open field. And on the, on the Republican side, you actually have this really vigorous internal debate over how to think about tech companies. And then on the Democratic side, there is this um, much quieter debate because those companies are also donors. So um, a lot of a lot of the talk about treating tech companies as national champions actually comes from the left. There was a, a joint op-ed signed by, I think, three or four former secretaries of defense, all from Democratic administrations, saying that Chinese AI is a strategic threat to U.S. interests, and we need to do what we can to make big tech companies more powerful and more able to compete. Um, Eric Schmidt has been talking about this, too. Perhaps not a coincidence that Schmidt has been writing op-eds and uh, ex-secretaries of defense have been writing op-eds. and Schmidt um, was at Google for a long time, and Google does a lot of AI stuff. So I think they're sort of trying to shift the debate from AI is this neutral force, Google is this very global, very cosmopolitan kind of company, to we actually live in a bipolar world, and tech companies are one of the assets that the U.S. has that um, other countries have, but can't really, they can't match the scale, so that we need to treat those as um, really important assets to the U.S. as a strategic actor. A few follow-ups to that. One is, when we, when we talk about the stock market, what's the mental model for thinking about uh, how much of it is sort of retail sentiment versus institutional sentiment? Is it, is it dominated by one, or is it, you know, equally both? Um, and from your perspective on sort of the ethics and incentives around buybacks, like how should we be thinking about that conversation and, and, and bailouts too? You know, we had Chamath, sort of, you know, billionaire folk hero now that is sort of a topic in itself, come on and have that sort of legendary line about, you know, we, we shouldn't, uh, or funny line, I should say, uh, we shouldn't bail them out that went viral. Um, how, how should we, where was he right? Where was he wrong? How should we be thinking about these things? So the first thing I'd say on buybacks is that the, the problem we've expressed with buybacks right now is that the companies earn money and they don't have it anymore, that they spent it on some other thing. And so the first thing to do is ask yourself, would you feel that passionate if the company had paid an equal size dividend? Because really the material differences between those two are that dividends are less tax efficient, dividends have a different cosmetic impact on whether your return comes from higher earnings per share growth or higher dividend payouts from existing shares. But, but really, whether you're, um, whether you're um, if a company pays a dividend and a buyback, and let's say the dividend is 
1% and they buy back 3% of their stock every year. So from the buyback, the dividend grows 3% a year. So your return is that 1% dividend plus the 3% from the buyback plus whatever risk that you can get. If the company did no buybacks and paid a 4%, had a 4% dividend yield and the dividend yield didn't grow because they weren't shrinking the shares outstanding and the company is static, you'd have basically the same return. You just pay taxes every year on the dividend and the company would have the same cash outflow profile where they earn free cash flow from the business. It all goes back to the shareholders, so the company doesn't have it. Um, if you look at some of the companies that are are being critiqued for this, like they would have to have a lot of cash on hand to withstand what's going on right now. So if you have um, if you have like a, a ten percent operating margin, that means that you have to save like ten years of cash. Well, or, yeah, something like ten years of cash to to pay all of your expenses for a year with no revenue, and um, it would be kind of weird for a company to say that that's what they were doing, that um, that this company is going to cut its dividend to zero and stop buying back stock for the next decade in case all of their revenue disappears overnight. Um, the other possibility is that if companies weren't doing buybacks, they'd reinvest in their business. But in a lot of cases, that would mean that they have more assets that have more operating expenses. So if all the airlines, for example, had been buying more planes and more routes instead of um, buying back stock, then their overhead would be a lot higher, their ongoing expenses would be a lot higher, they'd have a lot more planes to park, and so they'd need a bigger bailout. So um, they didn't decide to minimize the amount of bailout that they would need by buying back stock instead of growing the companies, but that is one of the inadvertent effects of what they did. Um, you can you can also look at the the airlines in particular as a, an interesting case study because the airline industry has has been pretty much zeroed out before. Um, a, basically, all of the major airlines have gone through bankruptcy, so shareholders have been wiped out. And one possibility is just that structurally, the airline industry is not designed for companies for equity holders to never go under. They will probably lose all of their money periodically. And there are assets that actually work just fine on that basis. So there are entities like a royalty trust where the trust buys a bunch of land with oil underneath. And when the price of oil is positive, they get royalties and uh, people drill for oil, but eventually the oil runs out. So eventually by design, it goes to zero. Or you can look at things like the equity tranche of a structured product in the credit space where you, you bundle a bunch of assets together and um, you borrow against those assets and you can borrow, you could say some of the borrowings are safer than the average asset in there because they are more collateralized. Some of them are riskier. And then there's this last slice where it's, it's the money that's left over if every, every borrower gets, um, every borrower within your pool of assets pays all of their debt all the time. So that's the equity tranche. It's, uh, is in 2006, when this was more of a live issue, that was the part that was really hard to sell. A lot of it ended up on bank balance sheets or ended up part of really, really complicated and fascinating to, to me trades. But um, that, that asset is also designed to have a super high yield that goes to zero in fairly short order and then never comes back. So that may be just how airlines should operate, is that every once in a while, something bad will happen and they'll all get zeroed out whether that's um, really high gas prices or really high oil prices or a steep drop in demand plus an increase in costs or just some other random factor that causes them to run into a lot of trouble at once. It, it may just be a factor or it may just be the way that that industry has to operate. And what about, um, or what about the, the, the first part of the question? Or whatever. What about the, the, the stock market in terms of retail versus institutions? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so that... Um, retail dollars are big in the aggregate, but a lot of them go into passive vehicles. And so a lot of that money just doesn't, doesn't change its mind that much. Like a whole lot of retail money in the stock market is invested in funds offered by Vanguard or somebody like that. And these funds just buy the entire index. They'll buy a mix of stocks and bonds, depending on the expected retirement date of the person buying the fund. So those have an effect on demand in the aggregate, but they don't have an effect on the pricing of individual equities. Then you have retail investors who actually do really crazy YOLO stuff on Robinhood. And um, that the Wall Street Bets subreddit is incredibly entertaining. I really love reading it, but it's also really scary. It's basically the 
there's a dude hold my beer subreddit, which is gifs of people who hope we didn't die at the end of the gif. And um, the Wall Street bets is basically that for finance. So you have people who are up 50x year to date, and then they lose 200% of their money in a day. Um, but those people are a really small proportion of the market. So they can push around some stocks. Um, the um, Virgin Galactic was a case where basically that stock got hyped so much by Wall Street bets that it was uh, one of the better performers in the market earlier in this year. There was a Wall Street bets write up of um, maybe Lumber Liquid or some, some smallish retailer like that that actually pushed the stock up something like 15 or 20 percent on the day. And this is this is a billion dollar market cap company. So not a not a penny stock, but also not a meaningful part of the market. No real effect on market performance as a whole. And Wall Street Bets has cracked down on that stuff because it's it's pretty illegal. Um, so so we get back to retail investors do not have a huge impact on individual equity prices. They do have an impact on flows into equities in the aggregate. And that has impacts on the market structure because if you have more money moving out of actively managed mutual funds, moving into passive, you get some effects like um, that the, there's, there's less price discovery going on. On the other hand, the, um, the people who are active investors at institutions, so hedge fund people, have actually gotten a lot more informed and just a lot better at accurately pricing stocks. So, um, so what that ends up meaning is that a lot of intra-quarter news flow gets digested very quickly by the market. Prices tend to be pretty efficient from day to day. And then every quarter, every time there's an event, typically a lot of hedge funds, sophisticated hedge funds, are looking at similar data sets, talking to similar people, talking to one another. So they're all positioned on one side of the trade. So you do end up with these huge quarterly blowups that seem totally disproportionate, but actually make sense in light of that change in the market structure. You mentioned, um, we're talking about the, the 2024, let's talk about 2020 first. How do the politics of what's happening uh, change uh, uh, perception or response or, or affect uh, you know, what's going to happen in the next six months? How do you view that in, in light of the election? Yeah, that is uh, clearly a really tough one. Like that's, that is the big source of political uncertainty in the world is how how does the epidemic play out? How does the macro recovery play out? Like there's, it actually goes back to the institutional trust thing where Trump's approval rating actually went up as the crisis got really bad and has since pulled back a little bit. But um, people tend to start um, finding reasons to trust whoever's in charge when there's a crisis and they really want somebody to be in charge. Um, that doesn't mean his approval rating is going to, um, going to hit 50%. That that would be crazy, but it, it does mean that the the direct impact. It's it's not like he's getting a continuous performance review from a manager with a list of KPIs. And one of the KPIs is don't allow a mass casualty event that is preventable. And you whiffed on that one this quarter, so you get dinged. It's um it's not like that. What what will have to happen is um, a we'll have to see how bad things get, both in terms of um, the, the growth in cases, which is at least right now following um, a healthier cadence than it was a few weeks ago. So now, now the question is not, do we get freaked out that it's going to get us all under the current status quo? The question is, how freaked out should we be about how sustainable the current status quo is? Um, historically, when you look at the impact of, um, it's, it's tough to look at the impact of these exogenous once in a century events on presidential elections because our sample size is one a century. But um, if you look at the effect of the economy on presidential elections, typically it seems like momentum matters more than absolute performance. So it's possible that Trump can actually do the corporate maneuver of announcing all the possible economic bad news, like front loading every possible piece of economic bad news into Q1 and Q2 of 2020, such that Q3 is objectively one of the worst economies we've ever experienced, but is also a pretty rapid recovery from the depths of Q2. So if, if unemployment is trending in the right direction in Q3, and if people are getting back to work, if you see more people on the streets, even though they're all wearing masks, and if oil isn't being, uh, if you don't get paid to take delivery of oil, then maybe people will feel more optimistic and, uh, and Trump will get reelected. And then there's, there's the Biden question, both, uh, both the question of 
what what kinds of policies, policy proposals, and uh, just marketing will he introduce, and also just the question of um, Trump. Trump is really really good at driving up people's negatives. Like if you look at the the Republican primary, it was basically a story of. Trump always being the um, the second most popular, but kind of um, a guy people had very polarized opinions about, and whoever was most popular, their negatives would keep going up until they were no longer a factor. And Trump was the guy driving up those negatives. So when Trump focuses all of his intention, all of his attention on belittling you, then um, you quickly become one of the more hated people in the country, no matter how swell you are. And same thing happened in 2016, that they knew they couldn't get the country to like Trump, but they could get the country to loathe Hillary. And um, as it turns out, there's there's always that debate, uh, like people like to say that love is more powerful than hate, but in terms of driving turnout, it's pretty clear that hate wins. So uh, <laughs> just just from the tactical standpoint, that's how I'd expect things to play out, is that people will find more and more reasons to dislike Biden over time. They'll also get more disgusted with the entire process. And then the other factor that um, is not as talked about, but I think is super interesting, is that part of why Trump won in 2016 was Facebook. And it wasn't the Russians or Cambridge Analytica. It was just they ran a conventional large budget Facebook ad campaign with lots of copies, lots of images, lots of email capture, lots of this recursive email capture of we've got your email, so our ads are going to try to get all of your friends in this loop. And um, they could also do things like test campaign messages and ads ahead of campaign events. And this is all stuff that um, is pretty standard for, for large companies. Like if you're launching a new product, you might test out highlighting different features in your existing product line, see which features people really go crazy for, and then that's the upgrade that you emphasize the, at, when you launch the next iPhone or whatever. That stuff is pretty pretty normal, but um, the Democrats didn't really do a good job of that in 2016. And that is especially surprising because in 2008 and 2012, they were doing a lot of the micro-targeting and a lot of the... Um, a lot of the email capture and a lot of the really clever advertising stuff that uh, the people who were freaked out about Cambridge Analytica doing, but um, they they did a really good job of it. In uh, Obama's campaign, they did a really good job on digital in 2008 and 2012, and it seems like all of that institutional knowledge, all that process knowledge, somehow got lost in 2016. And it's looking like, at least just in terms of ad count, that Trump is still well ahead of um, the Democrats. And uh, we'll see if they really ramp things up for the national election. But it looks like Trump will still have the Facebook advantage on paid spend. And then, of course, he has the, the media advantage of always being able to get attention. Although, given what he, how he gets the attention, what he does with it, it that is uh, not strictly an advantage. It's just a thing. Is, is Biden, if, 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 if the theory is hate, <laughs> you know, is, uh, is Biden less... Uh, 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 easy to hate than, than someone like Bernie or, or, or Warren and thus is he a not bad de Democratic candidate uh, out of out of all the, all the ones and, and does does he have a chance in your view and you mentioned 2024 whoever wins won't be running is that because you think he's going to die? I, I think he will retire gracefully afterwards if he wins um, or yeah something by 2024 it will be clear that that they that both parties will need to pick a new candidate for that, or I guess by 2023, it'll be very clear that both parties need to pick someone new. Um, yeah, Biden seems like a really likable guy. Like he's, he is a natural politician. So it's great for him that he's been able to do what he should be doing with his life for his entire life. Um, so it, it will be more challenging. Whereas with Hillary, A, you had just this residual hatred of the Clintons generally. And um, a lot of Trump's demographic is old enough that they were watching the news in the 90s. And depending on what they were watching, they might have gotten some really interesting stories about Hillary Clinton um, or about the Clintons in general. So in that sense, Trump had more of a, a basis for this. But Trump got a lot of people to really dislike Rubio. I guess a lot of people already dislike Cruz, but he got more of them to do so. Um, Jeb. I don't think anyone had a strong opinion on Jeb anywhere um, except the donors for a while, but Trump managed to get people to feel contemptuous of Jeb. In fact, maybe contempt is is the right word rather than hate, that, that Trump is really good at driving up negatives, and that is one of the negatives. And part of that is because Trump has this hyper-exaggerated, hyper-American way of uh, presenting himself and um, his rhetoric. Like, he's 
he's very, there's a reason that when, um, when hip hop artists are trying to cite the classic American businessman, um, it's, it's Trump, not Gates. Gates is just not, not as interesting a character or not as interesting a media presented character as Trump. So, so Trump is able to really, um, really talk about this paradoxically optimistic view of himself and himself as a sort of avatar for a set of American values that a lot of Americans take pride in, not because they're strictly great values, but because a lot of people in other countries look down on Americans for being loud and brassy and willing to take insane risks and you know, willing to start a company and then just totally run it into the ground and declare bankruptcy. This is all stuff that, that people in Britain and France and Japan would uh, look down on Americans for. So inevitably we have to feel feel pride in this set of national traits um, just as a just as a sort of low level antagonism with, with people who would otherwise uh, not think that highly of us. The um, is is whether it's going to be a U shaped recovery, V shaped recovery, L shaped recovery. Is that, is that the right way of, of thinking about it? I mean, those are those are all shapes. Um, some of them will, one of them will sort of line up with whatever the graph ultimately looks like. Um, it's what I would say is the defining factor for L shape versus V shape versus versus other shapes is what happens to small businesses over the next couple of months because pretty much throughout the country, the vast majority of small businesses cannot survive in their current form. So, absent either a incredibly generous lender forbearance that we shouldn't expect to happen on its own or be massive policy that somehow works its way down to several million independent restaurants and all these other tiny businesses that absent that a lot of these businesses will go under it'll take a long time for um for a the owners and employees of those to recover and b for the country as a whole to recover from just the lost um brand capital the lost team camaraderie that does increase productivity over time there's a lot of these intangible benefits to just working with the same people at the same job for a long time, such that even if you have the same job title and description, you're doing the same things every day, if you're working for somebody else, you, you won't have quite the same, uh, quite the same productivity. So if you think of like your productivity, the first week that you were working in this job versus your productivity and your ability to collaborate with coworkers and your ability to represent the firm outside the firm. All of those things ratchet up a whole lot and they continue to improve the longer you stay at one company. So we lose a lot of that and um, that doesn't show up on any balance sheet, but it will show up in a, a slower recovery than you'd expect if you just thought that it's, we have these physical assets, they're still here, we have human beings, most of them are still here. So if we just squish these two things together, we get exactly the same reaction we were going to get. It's, the, it's, not, um, it's not a chemistry problem. It's actually a jigsaw puzzle. And uh, we will be destroying and throwing away some of the pieces. What actually happens to the political parties themselves? Do they, you know, they both seem broken. Do, do we have, do they disrupt the, themselves? Do we have new parties? Do they sort of reform more incrementally? What, what happens to, to that? So the line, I think it's from Adam Smith that um, someone told him that some policy would be the ruin of this country. And he said, sir, there is a lot of ruin in the country. And I think that's true of any large institution. You just have to make so many mistakes to actually lose. And it's really unclear if the, if the major parties have made enough mistakes to lose. They've, they've made enough mistakes to deserve to, but I don't know if justice will be served. And it's also the fact that a lot of times when we go through a crisis, whether it's the financial crisis or 9-11 or um, even going back to things like the Cuban Missile Crisis, it always, or Vietnam even, it, it always feels like everything is different. And then five years later, we remember it and we see some cosmetic differences, but a lot of things are the same. And 10 years later, there are still differences that stuck around, but almost everything is the same. And certainly very few people have been totally discredited and driven from public life, even if things were quite bad during the crisis. And even if you can point to specific mistakes that they made, they were warned about that they did anyway, that they shouldn't have made. So in that sense, maybe things just keep on going because um, whenever there's that drop in trust, you still have to have somebody to trust. And if you could trust them less than before, if you need to trust somebody more than you did before, then they're still who you pick. The, um, 
of course, during moments like this, it's always most interesting to look at whose status has, has risen and whose is, uh, whose is decreased. Um, two people that come to mind, for me, Peter Zahan just keeps, keeps seemed to uh, ride the wave. Uh, Balaji uh, has uh, seemed to increase his, his status. He seemed to own the journalists uh, in, uh, in, <laughs> in uh, you know, trem tremendous ways and, 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 and sort of the sort of hatred towards Vox and BuzzFeed seems to have bubbled up to a point where, where it's exploded. How do you make sense of, 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 of what, what's all happened there and, and sort of the rise of all status of relative groups? Yeah, you know, within my filter bubble, it's definitely true, but my filter bubble also didn't like those media outlets and did like those people before. So what our experience is, we were totally vindicated and our enemies were humiliated. And yet I kind of suspect that's everyone's experience. Like the, the New York Times does not have this view that big media companies downplayed the crisis and that independent experts were the only ones you could trust. Their view is a lot more that somebody else downplayed the crisis. It was, it was Trump and Hannity and that the Times, to the extent that it needs to interrogate what it did, it, the Times did fine. And you can go back, you can find articles from the Times. Um, I think January 5th was the first one I found on coronavirus talking about there's this new infection in China and people are getting sick and that's actually pretty early like they they knew about it fairly early it might have been might have been late January but I think it was I think it was the fifth um, they they were not at that time saying that it's going to be awful saying that it would spread to the U.S. it looked like a China problem to a lot of people for a very long time but they they can at least credibly and with technical accuracy say that they were sounding some sort of alarm about this fairly early. I think a lot of people will be doing that. A lot of people will be looking at what they said that was ambiguous, and if they were wrong, did they make a prediction or a conditional prediction? Um, like a lot, of, a lot of the things people said in January and February took the form of, if X happens, this could be really bad, or if Y happens, this will not be a problem. And so as long as X and Y have somewhat fuzzy definitions, then you're, you're sort of safe. And I'm sure Vox's traffic and BuzzFeed traffic have not gone down over the last few weeks, even though in my view, they've lost a lot of credibility. Um, there, people will still want to read them. And if it's a media site, it has that wonderful property of defining narratives, including narratives about itself, whether that's explicitly or implicitly. And so there's, there's some, some closure there where if you always read Vox and BuzzFeed and you didn't know that Bology was concerned about this in, in, in January and February and that there was this really negative recode article making fun of VCs for being too paranoid or BuzzFeed calling them all bubble boy or whatever. Like if you don't know about that because BuzzFeed's not gonna highlight it for you, Vox is not gonna highlight it for you, then what you see in those online interactions is here's this random troll He's a rich tech guy and he's just yelling at journalists who are doing their job and their job is more important than it's ever been. So why, why is this terrible? Like what's this terrible person's nefarious motive? So it may be that the question is not, or the question is not whose status has gone up and down, but how has the, the status surface changed? And what's probably happened is that a lot of people feel vindicated now, will feel increasingly vindicated over time. So we'll all just be more mutually incomprehensible to each other. I'm using your thoughts on, on journalism more broadly. What one is, there's the debate over whether there ever was a golden era of journalism, and, and if so, when, when it was and what, what that looked like. Obviously, there were you know better incentives uh, because you know didn't have an ad based uh, or, or sort of uh, ad based business model the way that we have it today, competing with with everything. But at the same time we didn't have social media challenging it the way that we did today. So if we had, you know, the standards of journalism that we have today uh, with sort of the, uh, you know, of, of what happened in old, would, would we view it in the same way? That's one question. And two is what, what is the, what is the replacement? What do you think about the replacement or alternative that Bology and others are suggesting, which more towards, towards a local citizen journalism uh, model? Uh, how do you make sense of that? When I go back and read old articles in the Journal or the Times or, or Fortune or wherever, like articles from the 50s, 60s, 70s, they are really impressive and really well written. But when you read about what journalism was like 
then it does seem like a lot of them, like the writers were really good, but also that the sources were the same sourcing problems that we have today, where someone will give you a really impressive version of what's going on. You'll write down that version, you might apply your spin on it, and if you're already aligned with that person, then the spin is just going to exaggerate the things they were already exaggerating to you. So it, it's really well written, but it's well written fiction that just happened to be set in the present day. And so it, it makes me more skeptical and cynical about journalism generally. Like I think it is, um, it's definitely valuable to, to learn about the world. It's valuable to understand what's going on in the world, but it's also really hard. And I don't, I don't even know that things like the business model are the right way to look at it because both the ad model and the subscription model have their own mythologies. So with ads, your incentive is say whatever gets maximum attention and um, get all the clicks you can. With subscriptions, it is to say whatever keeps your subscriber base happy. So there tends to be this evaporative cooling effect where if you, if you have a lot of subscribers and some of them are left of center and some of them are right of center, but more of them lean one way, you say things that please that audience and you slowly lose the other audience until you actually have this very ideologically uniform set of readers and then you can't deviate at all. And they've learned to expect that from you. So they actually call you out. They, they've learned to expect things that comport with their views of the world. So they'll actually call you out more if you deviate from them at all. So um, in that sense, subscription does also tend to lead to some closure. Um, it, it's probably a healthier model because maybe it's better to at least force yourself to articulate some kind of coherent narrative for some people than it is to just say whatever you think would get the most attention for everybody, especially because one way to get attention is to have a lot of people arguing about things. So if you just pick a topic where half of people have a strong opinion one way, half of a strong opinion another way, and you know that they will spitefully yell at each other on Twitter and Facebook over whatever it is that you're saying, you have an incentive to say it. So the ad-driven model has an incentive to produce conflict, and then the subscription model has a tendency to produce passive aggression, where you give people this really well curated news bubble, and then when they step outside of that bubble, people are saying people are talking about narratives that they just hadn't heard of, and um, all of those sound like conspiracy theories because if the Times wasn't reporting on it, then well, did it even really happen? So um, it, it leads to more more mutual incomprehension. And the best media sources are generally paid media sources. Um, I, I subscribe to the FT, like apparently a lot of people in finance and every democratic socialist. I don't know why they all started doing it, but they actually do have good taste in that respect. Um, and the FT does have its own little narrative, but since it's also a business publication, it has to anchor things to economic reality. And I think that that gets to another piece of the, the news economics puzzle, which is there have always been news sources that were fairly factual, but they're also very boring because people are using them to make financial decisions, but usually economic news at any level is very incremental. Usually the news is like car production, everyone thought it would go up 2% year over year this month, but it actually went up 1.5. So here are 5,000 words on the implications of that for everyone in the car industry. Now, if you're in the car industry or you're in that supply chain, you care very deeply, so it's interesting to you, but it's not objectively interesting to anybody else. However, you will get mad if they get the number wrong. So that, that does provide fact-based media, but only for the facts that matter for business decisions and asset prices. So like Bloomberg in that case, in that sense, is a very fact-driven organization. Like they are, their mandate is basically assemble as many facts as possible and get them in front of people in real time in as few keystrokes as you conceivably can. And they do a really good job of it. But most people, if you gave them a free Bloomberg terminal, they'd use it for a little while and then they'd get bored and probably go back to BuzzFeed or Daily Caller or something a lot more fun. Yeah. The, we mentioned Zehan is... Um, you know, one of Zayan's big sort of predictions is that China is going to implode and it can implode in, in any number of, of ways. Uh, and Naval has talked about post-COVID, you know, China just having a much worse uh, and, uh, a brand. Um, how do we make sense of, of Zayan's predictions about China and then that sort of uh, declaration about Naval about China's brand post-COVID? How do you think about that? Yeah, the frustrating thing with the China blow thesis is that that's been a possibility for a really long time. And now we can look back at the Mao era and the immediate post-Mao era and say that was actually a China blow up. Like that was 
mostly a cold civil war. Some parts of it were actually a hot civil war. Like there were, there were um, groups that literally occupied government buildings with guns. And when the government would send the send food and supplies to that city, they would actually get stolen by the bandits who were, of course, the true communists and the government was actually the capitalist voters, or the imperialist faction or whatever. Um, Deng Xiaoping basically shut that down. Uh, that that was probably probably a much more bloody and brutal process than will ever be recorded factually anywhere, but it did happen and uh, was clearly a whole lot better for the average person in China than, uh, than life under Mao and uh, life under the Maoists immediately thereafter. But in China, it's, it's easy to get lulled into this sense that you, you understand what the model is. Because right now the model for China is that they, get, they have political legitimacy as a party because they can achieve economic growth. And that's been the narrative for a long time. Like that was Deng's narrative was, if I'm not Mao, and if Mao actually exiled me for a while and only later brought me back, and I went up against the Maoist faction, how do I prove to people that I should be in charge? Well, one way is to make sure that they are richer this year than they were last year, and that if they extrapolate, their kids will actually be very well off indeed. And he did literally say that. Like Deng said that at one point that um, the Chinese Communist Party was in charge because the economy was growing, and that if GDP growth ever slid to 4%, that there would be a revolution. Uh, that was that was his number. That was a long time ago, so expectations have probably come down since then. But that is that is one view of how they stay in power. And then the other view is that they are they are still a totalitarian government. Then now they're a totalitarian government that has um, a lot of software and a lot of uh, machine learning capabilities, and uh, everybody has a smartphone, and all of those um, those smartphones are basically the, the interface to the country's operating system. So you use it to buy stuff, you use it to contact people, you use it now to prove that you are not contagious. You have to use facial recognition to unlock your phone. So um, they, they have built the infrastructure necessary for a, um, a much less dengist approach to staying in power. And um, you know, they, can, they can achieve legitimacy through, through repression and um, every year, the the probability of continuing to grow goes down, but the capability of staying in power without economic growth goes up. So that's to to the outside world. That's a China implosion. That means the factories in Shenzhen are are not humming, and that we no longer have ever cheaper consumer goods and apparel and all that other nice stuff. But from the Chinese Communist Party perspective, maybe that is the best possible outcome. Because they they um, got control of the country, it was shaky for a while, things nearly fell apart, and so everyone is quite worried about how bad things could get. In fact, a lot of them are, are personally worried. Like a, whole, a huge fraction of the senior leadership in the Communist Party was um, was part of the the sent down youth cohort, so young people who were taken out of school and ordered to do forced labor on collective farms um, during during the Cultural Revolution. So these people have extremely personal experience with what it's like when a government totally loses its mind and um, and starts starts just making completely wild and radical decisions. Like they, they remember being tired, they remember being hungry, they remember being poor and, and cold and all of that stuff. And that is something they want to prevent. And in in their worldview, stability is how you prevent that. And so the question is always how do you achieve stability? And within China they, they do have enormous resources for for solving that exact category of problem. Like they can the, the phone factories are in China, an increasing number of the components are sourced within China. Um, they've, uh, they actually have this really interesting machine learning supply chain. So one of the knocks on AI companies, which is true, is that AI companies are um, very OPEX heavy. So they don't have traditional software margins because to train a model, you actually have to have a lot of manual labeling of whatever it is that you're training your model on. But since China has a combination of 
lots of really smart CS PhDs and also lots of incredibly poor people in the countryside, they actually have within their country the low cost labor that you need to cheaply label data sets. Those people do speak the same language, so you don't have the, the translation issues you might have if you were a US company trying to outsource that, that task to, for example, China. So um, they are actually in a really good position to build extremely robust machine learning models and uh, track all sorts of crazy stuff. T totally. And, and when people, uh, I'm curious to your perspective on, on how Zion has been right or, or, or not it, 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 because of COVID, but also um, when people critique Zion, I, th I think two things I mentioned are that it doesn't take into account uh, technology uh, sufficiently um, and, and sort of the rate of technological change and how technology changes society. And that it also doesn't take into account maybe uh, culture uh, significantly. H how do you make sense of, of what I'm saying? Um, Zion really likes maps of precipitation and maps of hydrocarbon deposits. So of course that's, that is the stuff he's gonna focus on. I think the right response to that critique is, is not the critique is wrong, but that people are generally more likely to overvalue and overrate those things. It is just really easy to make really sweeping claims about how much technology will change the world. But if you, if you talk, if you got in your time machine and you talked to someone hundred years ago and you said, in the future, everyone will have this magical device that can answer any question you have and can tell you exactly where you are at any time. Um, and you ask them, well, what do people use this device for? And your answer is, well, they look at yellow journalism, just like the kind that you enjoy, and they get in political arguments, just like the kinds that you have, and they eat food that is pretty much recognizable to you. Uh, they order it on the app, so the hamburger arrives at their home rather than them having to go to the burger joint, but still the same recognizable stuff. So in a lot of ways, um, it's easy to overrate the impact and it's really easy to extrapolate when you only have a few data points. So um, I think that is, that's part of what's, um, what's refreshing about Zeihan is that he's not doing these crazy extrapolations and these more utopian predictions. And he's, he's actually asking about <clears throat> the hard material constraints on whatever that utopia is. Because you can you can look at one iPhone and you could say this is a really wondrous device. You could look at one social media app and say this is really cool. You can look at all of the all the things you have access to using that device, using that software. But to actually get that built does require a lot of physical infrastructure, and um, people have to get fed. And all of those constraints don't matter until they do. Like it, it doesn't matter that <clears throat> all the supply chains run through Shenzhen until Shenzhen is locked down and suddenly. There are shortages of lots of parts, and even if even if the factory that you're buying from is still open, maybe the factory that they're buying from is not open yet. <clears throat> so there could be these long-term rippling effects where there are, there are weird shortages that take a long time to show up and that are hard to measure, but and that are also <clears throat> really hard to solve. So yeah, that's I, I think Zehan is um, he's probably net useful even if he underrates that stuff, and also that. Um, a lot of the stuff that he's talking about is rooted in reality. <clears throat> like it may or may not matter what, how Russia and Saudi Arabia differ in their ability to voluntarily cut oil production. Like there are versions of the future where that doesn't matter very much. Clearly in this version, it matters a lot, but in, in theory, a lot of that stuff could end up not mattering. Is in a world of endless globalization and totally free trade, the, the local resource constraints don't ever matter everything just gets shipped to where it should be. So as long as there's somewhere in the world that can produce oil and somewhere in the world that can produce tin or whatever the material is, it all ends up in the right place eventually. But when you deglobalize, it starts to get really important that you have these elements of these hydrocarbons candy and cheap and these other ones you can't get access to. I want to switch topics here and talk about the Mark Andreessen It's Time to Build piece, which came out uh, uh, last week. Uh, I'm curious for your sense on on the piece, but more so sort of the the follow up conversation from the piece, and, and what was most interesting to you, or or resonated, uh, or, or how do you how do you think about the follow up comment? So I thought the piece was was fantastic, and that's exactly the right attitude. And um, one one really useful thing about spending your job with computers and um, working on software is that you can actually start the building process at least. From your bedroom while you're locked down or self-quarantining or whatever. So um, it was it was the right call to action at the right time. That said, a lot of what he's talking about building is obviously the physical infrastructure. And 
when, when you start asking how do we implement it, how do we solve the specific problems he's talking about, which in some cases the specific problems were just, we're not optimistic enough, we're not creating enough, we're being too, too negative, too focused on who to blame rather than what to do. But some of the problems he cited were just things like there are shortages of PPE in the US because we don't make enough and we can't source enough. And that turns into a political problem because one reason we don't is that under normal circumstances, those products are pretty low value added manufacturing. Like they're not trivial to produce, but they're not, um, they're not mind blowingly difficult to produce. And when the, the cost of labor goes up, those are the things that get offshore first. Um, the classic way that countries industrialize is they start with really low end stuff like t-shirts and shoes, and then they move up the value chain from there. So um, uh, an N95 mask is not a t-shirt, but um, it's also not a, you know, it's not a jet. So um, those are the things that countries tend to lose the capability to build as they get richer. And so to, to avert that, if you're actually worried about this, um, uh, you know, COVID, COVID-20 and COVID-21, um, which hopefully we get a few more years before we have another one of these, but you never know. Um, if you're worried about that stuff, you have, to, you have to make the policy decision of we are going to allocate money to something that is economically irrational, that is only rational if we have a pretty dark view of the future. So a view of the future where um, something really awful will happen and also the countries that we are depending on to help us get out of the mess will not, for whatever reason, want to help us in particular. So that, that requires a whole different political attitude towards uh, towards the outside world and towards all of our allies you can you could read into it a sort of national conservative subtext so I, I don't think that's the intended meaning i think the intended like when you're when you spend a lot of your time in in software and tech companies it is um, a lot easier to look at a market opportunity and pounce on it and um, you know that eventually if you're really really successful there will be a political dimension to what you've invested in and how that company operates but the political dimension happens later and you can kind of see it coming. But in this case, the political part is actually at the very beginning. So that that makes it challenging because then we're actually right back to where we started, which is now we're adversarial again. We're talking about who's at fault, who do we blame, who do we trust, all of these very person-to-person -person and group-to-group -group interactions rather than the, the ideal technology interaction, which is a small group of very smart people interact with the natural world or with the existing products that are available and create something totally new. No one, they don't have to ask anyone for permission. Um, it doesn't exist yet, so nobody can ban it. And you just do it and make it and people love it. And then you go on from there and eventually you IPO and A16Z reports really good numbers of their LPs. Like that's, that's the ideal story. And that is a story that um, he's lived through many times on the operating side and the investing side. So of course it's one that you should be, that he should be comfortable with at least, but it's, it's certainly not the only story that you can tell about economic activity and why people build the things they build. Yeah. It was in, in, interesting how um, he mentioned political parties specifically uh, in the piece and uh, what they should both uh, be doing. And I also think the term build is interesting because it's, it's, specific enough that it's sort of pro technology and pro companies, but also broad enough that um, it could sort of be a Rorschach, Rorschach test a little bit in terms of what you see, like uh, AOC's you know, chief of staff, who obviously disagrees, or former chief of staff, disagrees with Mark on lots of different topics, you know, tweeted about it and, and how, how much he loved it. Uh, I heard one critique, which was, you know, something along the lines of, you know, Taiwan didn't solve their problem by building, like it's, it's you know, building, or you could, some people argue that it solves some of our problems so that we build the wrong things, but that it's it's more this different type of you know uh, cross partisanship collaboration and what we need is more increased social social trust. What what comes to mind for you, Edu, after hearing one? Yeah, Taiwan is an interesting case because they they did actually have um, they they did develop their own sort of um, institutional immune response because of SARS. So they had a lot more of the playbook ready to go. They clearly implemented it very, very well. Um, Taiwan is a country where things get built. Like they have just huge um, semiconductor manufacturing capacity, for example. So um, they, are, they are builders. They do validate that in the really broad aggregate directional sense. But they also seem to have at the government level a lot more um, cohesion and a lot more just um, institutional like, state capacity. And at that point, it's, 
it is hard to say why that is, where that came from. Um, maybe the pat answer is just that they are a country that is right next to a much larger country that claims that, it, that Taiwan is a, a breakaway territory and really part of that country and will be taken over at some point. So they're facing an existential threat. Um, maybe the U.S. would have had that institutional competence from the 30s through the 70s when we had um, 30s existential threat of Great Depression, 40s, World War II, and then late 40s through 70s, Cold War is clearly a very pressing issue. Um, I feel like by the 70s, it was becoming less pressing. People were just more used to it. And uh, that's also when the, the slowdown in productivity started and when you started to see a lot more of these bone cost disease issues where the, the headcount and the payroll at um, service companies would go up and the size of the government would go up the output seemed to be mostly unaffected or going down, and nobody really seemed to understand what the nature of the problem was. So, so maybe, maybe the threat of total annihilation is actually what it takes to have competent institutions, in which case, maybe there's, there's a sense in which the, um, the countries uh, like the US and a lot of Western Europe where we don't have existential threats, or we don't think we have existential threats, so we don't handle crises very aggressively, Maybe if those threats are real, we're, we're probabilistically better off because we have a better chance of suffering from something really bad, but a lower chance of experiencing something just like annihilation level. Maybe that's, uh, maybe that's too cute a version of this story, but like that, that is one version of the story because it is, it, it is striking that Taiwan of all places had such an excellent reaction. Singapore was really impressive early on and i still think their their approach was impressive but clearly there was more that they had to do um, they don't have the same kind of total existential risk although i'm sure that um, senior policymakers there spend a lot of time thinking about china and what china would want to do with a uh, a wealthy nearby city state that um, that is ethnically very similar to china but culturally quite distinct um, i'm sure it's crossed their mind that things could get scary not not in the near future but at some point but i, I don't think they they feel the existential threat quite as keenly how do you make sense of uh of of sort of bill gates's uh actions uh sort of in the COVID era and how how society has responded to it so i think he's doing exactly the right things um in part this was the combination of he was ready for this category of problem was literally warning us that we're not prepared for pandemics and that eventually one of them will arrive and we will all feel very bad that we were unprepared. And he's actually taking action. So stuff like scaling up production for multiple vaccines on the assumption that most of them will fail, but only one of them needs to work. That is the right kind of thinking. That is Manhattan Project style thinking because that's literally what they did was uh, they found several ways that might produce uh, enough fissile material. They ran them all in parallel because if you tried one after the other, you have your bomb by the time the war is over and you don't need it anymore. So in that sense, um, I think he's doing great. You can actually see echoes of that in his earlier career where um, he, there was an opportunity, a lot of people didn't seize, uh, seize it and Bill Gates happened to be extremely well prepared for it because in 1975 when the, the Altair was announced, there were very few people who had ever seen or used or thought about a computer. It was clearly just this hobbyist thing nobody, nobody quite cared about, but Gates, his, um, his middle school had been given a computer and he spent all of his time programming on the computer. And then he found a shared computer at a, a startup near the school and used that computer for a while. So there was, um, given how few computers there were and given how few people had access to them and given that a lot of them would have been at universities or at huge companies or um, research research labs and things i think it's pretty likely not certain but pretty likely that no human being on earth had spent a greater percentage of their life programming than bill gates when the first personal computer was announced so he may have been the single best position person, like the best conceivably position person to take advantage of that. And one reading of that is he got lucky. And reading the Microsoft story, there were a lot of cases where Microsoft had extremely lucky breaks. But another version is that um, 
a lot of smart people are surprisingly lucky in that their hobby turns out to be a really big deal. And it's always weird how many people thought that Bitcoin was a really, really cool concept, even though Bitcoins were worthless and they would you know, make your fans spin really loudly when you were mining them on your laptop. And anyway, 50 Bitcoins is only a dollar. So why bother wasting the power to do that? Like there, there was a point where a lot of those people were laughed at and um, now those people who got in that early at least look pretty smart. So he, he may just have a really good sense for what the unexploited opportunities are. And um, it may just be that intellectually curious people who um, have either the unlimited resource of unlimited free time because you're an upper middle class kid and classes are not that demanding, your parents let you do what you want, or because you're one of the richest people on earth. So whatever you want to do, you can do, and you can do it to the maximum conceivable extent. Um, so those are, those are the two times where Bill Gates had access to resources nobody else had and also used them really well. And um, it turned out so far quite well. Talk, talk a little bit about what's happening with, with pensions and how we should make sense of that. All right, pensions. So this, is, this has been a hobby horse of mine for a while now. Um, public pensions in, so this is things like teachers, retirements, police officers, government employees. Um, there are a lot of public pensions. Um, most states will have multiple pensions. Um, I think Illinois has something like 650 or so. Uh, a lot of those are small, some of them are big. But public pensions are uh, basically a pooled annuity program. So you put a little of your paycheck in every pay period, and after you retire, you get a fixed amount of money for as long as you live. So they, um, they have money that they owe to beneficiaries, and then they have assets they use to service that debt. Pensions, pension math is, um, can, be, can be somewhat complicated and non-intuitive, but the things to keep in mind are, one, that the, the size of the pension liability is an estimate. It's based on actuarial tables, which are gonna be pretty straightforward, and it's based on an expected rate of return. And then to get to that expected rate of return, you have a mix of stocks, bonds, hedge funds, venture capital, real estate, whatever. Um, you can actually afford to take some risks in a pension because you don't pay out the money for a really long time. So you have a multi-decade time horizon. You can actually afford to back the kinds of investments where it looks bad for the first five years and then, then you do well. So in theory, pensions should be thinking really, really long term. In practice, what's happened is pensions estimated rates of return, which determine the size of their liabilities. So the higher you say your return will be, the lower your current liability is. Pensions have consistently had unrealistically high rates of return. And even on the basis of, the, of those rates, they've been underfunded. So they, the pension will, like the Illinois teacher's pension or whatever, I don't have the, the numbers handy, but let's say they claim that their liability is $50 billion. But realistically, the liability might be 60 or 70. And they only have like 30 billion on hand. The state will always say that they have a plan to get back to even where the state's gonna contribute more money and employee contributions will go up. And the way those plans always work, they're like the corporate turnaround plan where it's like, over the next year, things will look really, really bad. And then we expect a huge acceleration year after that. And the huge acceleration never comes. That's what pensions have been doing for a long time. Illinois is the most egregious one, but um, there are other states that are also in pretty dire straits. The other thing pensions have been doing though, is they've been taking more risk. So. Historically, pensions were fairly conservative because while they have a long time horizon, they also can't lose their money permanently. They, they really don't want to take giant risks. So they would put a lot of their money into bonds. And over time, as interest rates have come down, the returns on bonds have gone down and they have not lowered their return expectations. So the only way to hit their numbers is to invest in things that have historically done better, like equities. And within equities, you could just buy traditional stocks, publicly traded companies, or you could do something like invest in a private equity firm. It's going to buy out companies with leverage, turn them around, and then resell them. So that should be riskier, but have an even higher return. Um, here's where we get to the, the part of pension math that is um, not intuitive from the outside. So the size of that liability, the real size of that liability, is actually a function of future interest rates. If you think of a bond, if interest rates go down, all else being equal, the value of that bond goes up and vice versa. Well, the pension, funds act, the pension fund's liability is in effect one of those bonds. If interest rates go down, the net present value of that annuity goes up, 
like from the purely mathematical perspective that to buy that same stream of income when interest rates are low costs you a lot more money than to buy it when interest rates are high. So when interest rates drop, the pension, the real liability, not the state of liability, the real liability goes up. Now, equities and interest rates have an interesting relationship, which is that historically, when interest rates go down and bonds go up, stocks go down. That's not because interest rates make stocks go down. It's because interest rates go down when the broader economy is doing poorly. And when the broader economy is doing poorly, stocks go way down. And the interest rate, just, the interest rate drop just makes it less severe than it could have been. Uh, that's not always true historically, but it's been pretty much pretty reliable since the late '90s, and there are some some macro reasons why um, that that are actually worth getting into in this case. So the reason why is that interest rates move for two reasons. One is that the central bank wants to stimulate the economy and avert a recession or slow down the economy and prevent like runaway growth. The other is just to control, um, control inflation regardless of what that does to the broader economy. When inflation is high, interest rates and uh, bonds and stocks have kind of an uncertain relationship where obviously bonds are gonna go up when interest rates go down, but if inflation expectations go up too much, then maybe the bonds don't react the way you'd expect and stocks are a little wobbly too. But the lower inflation gets, the more it is the case that the only reason that the, that a central bank will adjust interest rates is to stimulate the economy, which means that the inverse correlation between stock prices and bond prices goes up. So if you have a combination of pension funds are overweight equities and equities have gone down and interest rates have gone down, then you have their assets taking a nosedive, their liabilities going up. And if you view it as likely that the, the net effect of COVID-19 will have some deflationary components in terms of asset prices. So banks will have a lot of bad debt on their books. They won't want to extend more credit. So things like houses will go down in price and other assets will go down in price, even if consumer goods are um, potentially fluctuating, but more for supply, like supply reasons and kinks in the supply chain rather than absolute dollar demand for the set of oil goods and services produced in the country. Then you end up in a case where you have a deflationary environment in the aggregate. And, um, and that means that the interest rates, that interest rates go as low as they could possibly go, which means the present value of that pension liability goes as high as it could possibly go. And meanwhile, equities are still challenged. So that's the nightmare scenario. That is, um, I know I talked earlier about how the, the long-term effect of COVID-19 could be inflationary, deflationary, that we might actually get stuck at this high absolute rate of inflation so we don't have deflationary collapses. So this is just one of the possible event paths. But what remains true is that pensions have been underfunded systematically for a long time. They've been taking too much risk. Now both of those problems are coming before. And Illinois has actually requested a bailout of their pension liabilities. I think they asked for something, something like 15% of the money they need, 10 billion for pensions. But given that the Fed is backstopping muni debt issuance, um, it is possible that every state will just use that to top up pensions as much as they can. And if they do that, then they can finally get the pensions actually aligned correctly, where they top them up and they also cut their expected return um, based on the fact that interest rates are a lot lower and that growth is probably gonna be lower for the next few years. So they actually have a much bigger pension liability than they admitted to, but they can monetize it all because they're, um, they can issue an unlimited amount of municipal debt. So in that case, you, you actually end up with a situation where Balance sheets look a lot worse. Like it looks like the Fed is just printing gobs of money. It looks like every state is running massive deficits, but all they're doing is admitting to a problem that has existed for 10 or 20 years and has become undeniable in the last few months. Yeah. Um, the net effect of that on asset prices is probably that they don't buy a lot more equities, but they do buy a whole lot more long-term treasuries and corporate bonds. So it actually pushes down rates um, throughout the yield curve and that'll have, um, it'll be interesting to see what the Fed does about that. It's I mean, given the amount of, of, of printing and where we are, I wonder why there isn't more serious conversation around like, hey, let's just forgive student loans. That's just, what's another trillion or, you know, other sort of, you know, conversations like that. Do you see that happening? Um, I, I don't know that forgiving student loans would be, uh, would be, that, that is not the, the kind of debt that I think we should focus on forgiving because 
college educated people are actually, they, A, they have higher incomes than average. So it's a wealth transfer to higher income people. Um, maybe they would spend that. Maybe it would actually juice the economy. I'm not entirely sure that that's true, but you could sort of get to some post-Keynesian or neo-Keynesian um, justification for that. But if you're going to dole out that amount of money, um, it, it would actually probably be better from a total utility standpoint to um, give it to everybody who doesn't have a college degree, or at least every, especially everybody who doesn't have college debt. So I'm not sure about that one. It's um, you're you're sort of you're, you're thinking sort of like the Fed here, where there's there is an asset, there's like a really big fat target, and you have your kind of inaccurate but very explosive bazooka. So you can shoot that target, you know you'll blow it up, but is that the thing you want to shoot? Maybe maybe the goal should be to somehow assemble a sniper rifle and shoot the exact thing that you actually want to hit. So yeah, student loans. I'm not not super enthused about doing about that as a priority. I do think the the college system is broken, but the existing stock of student loans is probably not the, the exact place where it is broken right now. And also, right right now, college educated people are way more likely to be able to work from home, whereas people who are who went to high school and now they're stocking shelves, driving trucks, they were attending bar, etc. They can't really do that. So. It's, that's another uh, another reason that we should focus on bailing out the, the non-Zoom Americans. Our colleges is, is sort of the end of uh, colleges that aren't, you know, Harvard and Stanford being accelerated rapidly through this, where people are you know, having online education and paying for it as if, as if it were in person and realizing it's not worth it, or is it more so just proving the power that that they have and and that how strong the the brands are that even if we know it's sort of a sham, we're willing to pay for it. Are people going to go back to school? What's going to shake out here? So it sounds like a lot of colleges are planning to do remote the first couple months of the fall semester. And at that point, people are going to make serious price comparisons between college and Lambda School and other, other education sources like that. In fact, I'm wondering if you'll start to have people who are college professors go through their contracts, see what the non-compete clause says, and see if they can just teach the same class and everyone who signs into the Zoom then knows them $20 per class. And they actually, they make more per hour, but the students pay a whole lot less per credit hour. They get the same information, they, they don't get the accreditation, but, but um, it'll also, there will be a period where it's a lot more forgivable to have gone to college for a while and not have gotten a college degree. Like a lot of people in 2020, it doesn't really matter if you technically graduate this year because for the last couple of months, you, it would be really hard to fail you. At the same time, if you had to do something like take care of a family member who got infected or there was some other way in which your life was severely disrupted by this and you couldn't actually complete your coursework, I don't think a lot of employers are going to say you only got three and a half years of your degree and um, we don't think there are any excuses during a pandemic coupled with the biggest recession ever for you to not have made your last semester your biggest priority. So there could be this weird period where the college degree requirement gets more wobbly. Meanwhile, more people get skeptical of going to college. Maybe they decide I'll I'll go, I'll take a gap year because I think I'd learn just as much doing other things and I want to go back when classes start. And then maybe that gap year actually ends up leading to a job that not only requires a college degree, but actually requires being the kind of person who could get into a college. And then you also have the, the demographic factor where the number of people turning 18 is, uh, is going to take a fairly steep dive in the next couple of years. So already a lot of the more middling colleges are wondering how they're going to survive 2024 and 2025. And this could accelerate that process where they realize that um, they'd rather die with dignity in short order rather than have just a really miserable half decade. Yeah. It's interesting. I've been thinking about uh, sort of signaling and credentialing recently. And it's interesting that Harvard is you know, only 7,000 or so students. If you think about uh, you know, Stanford is 7,000, Princeton is like 6,000, there's a few other schools in that, that caliber, similar size. You think anyone who's good enough to go to Stanford could go to Har Harvard. They could expand to, you know, 30,000, 50,000 without sort of, you know, hurting the, 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 the credential. It, it, um, but you'd have to 
but I talked about it with a couple of people and they're like, well, that's actually a sideshow to the endowment where that's, that's sort of the real, the, the, the real business. But I've, I've sort of thought about it also in, in the context of Y Combinator in terms of they've seemed to go from, you know, 20 companies a cohort to 250 and not really miss a, a beat as much. I, I think w the power of YC is they built their credential on the, um, the magnitude of the biggest outcome. They say no, no matter what, every cohort, whether there's 20 companies, 200 companies, yeah, I think you go to 1,000 companies, there's going to be an Airbnb. There's, and, and the whole game in venture is not missing Airbnb. Uh, so uh, the, I think it's less important uh, about the average company or average person and more so the magnitude of the biggest outcomes. You know, Teal 20 or 20 has amazing sort of, you know, average person is incredible, yet that doesn't have any near the cachet of, of YC or, or, or Harvard even. How, how do you make sense of this sort of this general understanding of signaling credentials and, and the idea of whether YC should go to 1,000 from 100 or Harvard should go from 7,000 to 50,000 or even down to 1,000? So YC is, um, is a really interesting example of how you would actually, how, they basically rebuilt a lot of the aspects of college just by accident. Um, they copied some things about college intentionally, like the original YC check was designed to be roughly what you'd get as a grad student for three months, but they ended up evolving into something that looked a whole lot like what a cynic would interpret as the goal of college, where it is this quick process of a, getting identified as a decent person by someone who's a trusted authority figure. Um, B, meeting a bunch of people who are similar to you in terms of their ambition, similar to you in terms of where they are in their life, who you can work with and you can share nice trusted experiences with um, in, the, in the coming decades. Um, there's a little bit of a function of getting potentially kicked out, but it's sort of like getting expelled from Harvard, where you'd have to really, really try to actually get expelled from a lot of those schools. Um, like, worst case, you just switch to an easier major or take a, take a semester off or something. So um, it's, it's sort of filtering for the very, filtering out the worst of the best. And then at the end of the school process, you are presented as a finished product to people who can hire you. And Harvard and Yale, Princeton, they, they all do this. They do this very well. YC has just realized that the part where you actually go to classes and learn things, that you do way too much of that compared to the value that it adds. And if you're the kind of person who will get a lot out of that, you'll probably want to do it on your own. And meanwhile, that maybe you should spend more time talking to talking one on one with your professor about the areas of research that you're most interested in rather than getting the, the fairly, fairly homogenized Bio 101, Western Civ, Physics, et cetera. Maybe that's just not the stuff that you should focus on. And they sort of, they slimmed it down. So it's not the same thing. It's not, um, it's not the same experience. And if you go to an elite school because you really, really love learning, if that is a better option than going to YC because you really, really love learning, which I'm sure is what YC would tell you as well. Um, but they've also recreated the endowment fund because YC ends up owning a piece of all these companies. The companies do very well. So YC has a lot of financial resources. So they, they ended up accidentally recreating basically every important trait of the elite schools. And then the trait that didn't turn out to be important is the one they haven't copied. So you can, you can view YC as a competition with the elite schools. I do think your point about the average outcome versus median outcome is really important because the target demo for, for Harvard, Princeton, et cetera, is, is not someone who's aiming to maximize the average. It's actually a parent who's aiming to maximize the median. So those schools are just insurance that you will remain upper middle class or better no matter what else happens with you. And that's part of why it's so competitive is that people are really, really competitive and really aggressive and very sharp elbow when they're controlling their downside. And um, they're a lot more positive sum and a lot more willing to relax when they're maximizing their upside. In part because to really maximize your personal upside is a necessarily non-competitive task because your personal upside is something you can offer the world that nobody else can offer. So to the extent that you get your contribution right, you should have a total monopoly on it. Whereas maximizing that median, minimizing that downside means there's a set of mistakes that you want to avoid. And since your class position is a positional one, there's a set of mistakes you want to be made by other people that you haven't made. And one of those mistakes is not getting into the very best schools. So the schools are offering something different. And I think from their perspective, keeping class sizes really tight. So, um, you know, having 
having a restrictive immigration policy into Harvardistan does keep GDP per capita in that little mini nation very, very high. And that may be what the constituents really want. They are sort of, they are nativists. Um, and it, they may, they, it may just be hard to shake that set of incentives because Harvard has to react to the incentives of um, not just the students. And of course, the average, for the average 18 year old, it's really good news if the number of people who get into Harvard goes up 10x. But for Harvard's employees, it's inconvenient and it, it lowers their prestige because now, now they're a large good school. So they, they've been downgraded to Cornell, um, which like if you work, if you're at Harvard, maybe that is like the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. Um, it, it, it's not really bad, but maybe to Harvard people it is. Um, there's also the constituency of um, the all the alumni. And the alumni will outnumber the new cohort of students unless you 40X or 50X the size of your incoming class. So the alumni know that part of their prestige comes from how exclusive it is, and they will be up in arms. And they're, they're a big chunk numerically of the people involved, but they're a bigger chunk financially. So they, they may actually have more pull because the, uh, the operating expenses of these schools will tend to, over time, tend to scale to the return to the endowment. So um, it's, it's very hard for those schools to risk giving up donations. So I, I think they're stuck. I think what will happen is lesser schools will um, go bankrupt and that'll be basically okay. That college degrees will be less mandatory than they were before. That alternative credentials will become a lot more popular. And that's something that the, the big companies basically have, they have a moral obligation to make that part happen. They have a moral obligation to um, relax college degree requirements, which some of them are already doing. And then um, elite schools will just, they will still be there. They will still look the same. They'll just be less and less relevant every year. If you read about ancient Rome, the Roman Senate kept meeting in Rome for um, several centuries after, A, several centuries after there was an emperor, and B, several centuries after Rome had been conquered. I think they finally stopped meeting in like the 1100s. So there is a long period where these very prestigious institutions just keep going through the motions and nobody cares but them, but since they're the ones who decide whether or not this process continues, it just continues and doesn't matter. Tyler Cowen had, had a blog post where basically he said, uh, you know, COVID lowers the status of sort of progressive politics or, or, or sort of that progressive agenda in general. Um, Jeff Lewis more poetically says the virus broke woke. Uh, so the obvious reasons about, hey, we need to focus on our safety, but in, in sort of, you know, after that, when things are sort of quote unquote back to normal, or the new normal, what, what, what does that look like for, for sort of the progressive agenda? How do you think about that? The interesting open question there is what happens within the Republican Party? Because there's this incredibly bizarre dynamic where if you had told me in December that there's going to be a pandemic and it's going to start in China, what do, what do you think Donald Trump thinks of that? I would say that the two most notable traits that Donald Trump has as a person are that he doesn't like China and he doesn't like germs. So this should be his crusade. Like it should be the, he should think of himself as the man of the hour, as the only person who, who should have, um, who, who should have been in charge for this. Like he'll, he'll actually believe in God instead of uh, just occasionally going to church because he thinks that Providence has selected a sinophobe and germaphobe to deal with the coronavirus. But that's not what happened because he actually seemed to care a lot more about the market. So he tried to downplay it because he knew it'd be bad for stocks to do anything about it. And then of course it was really bad for stocks to do what you have to do about it if you let it spread in multiple cities in the US uncontrolled for several weeks. And now there's this really odd situation where the like within the Republican Party, you have three cohorts. You have the Never Trumpers, which I hate to be this mean to them, but it seems like a jobs program that was established by people who really liked Jeb and still have money. Like it doesn't doesn't seem to actually connect with the world in any meaningful way, in part because Democrats have contempt with contempt for them for being Republicans, and the other Republicans have contempt for them for not being on board with Trump. And then within, within the more relevant cohort of Republicans, you have this huge chunk of establishment Republicans who were kind of uncomfortable with Trump, but these are the ones who responded very well when Trump 
drove up everybody else's negatives. And then you have the actual core ideological Trumpists. And that's a really weird group because I think they would all acknowledge that Trump did not start, he didn't, you know, read a bunch of works of political theory and read a bunch of history and come up with this notion of Trumpism, that he's not that kind of guy. He just did what made sense to him. And it turned out that you could actually build this reasonable theory around it, um, in part because a lot of what Trump is good at is very adversarial stuff and specifically really good at spotting weaknesses. And if you take a system like the US and um, the various various um, global institutions we're part of, and you treat them all as one entity and say that this entity, whether it's multinational capitalism or multilateralism or various alliances or various cultural norms of powerful institutions of the US, if you could say this institution did a really good job, basically conquered the world and has gone way too far, it's in decay, it's also in denial, then, then you'd want someone who's really good at attacking weakness, somebody who's really good at spotting flaws. And necessarily, the flaws that they spot reflect real-world deficiencies, and that means that they reflect traits about the real world. So you can back your way into an ideology of Trumpism through the combination of this very late-stage, post-Cold War system colliding with the wrecking ball that is Donald Trump. So they did that. They, they came up with their underlying theory of what Trumpism is, separate from Trump, and it is it is very skeptical of globalization, it's very skeptical of China in particular, very skeptical of immigration, fairly traditionalist, but um, sort of relaxed about that because the, the right has lost basically all of those battles at this point, and, uh, and Trump was not interested in fighting any of them. And those people were very early to Corona, and they were very agitated about it, and um, they were they were part of the group that was trying to get the government to do something. You basically had tech people and pseudonymous right-wing bodybuilders on Twitter. Those were the two groups that in January were buying masks and saying, we need a travel ban yesterday. Um, now the question is, do those people get vindicated because they, in addition to being right politically, they were correct, or do they become irrelevant because Trump, who was the core of their ideology, totally disregarded everything they had to say and still seems pretty reluctant to, to concede the severity of what happened and how much it could have been avoided. Um, that, that is the really interesting intra-conservative battle. I think the, the intra-left battle is less interesting because there's a much more visible figure who is clearly, um, clearly vulnerable, famous, and has made a lot of mistakes, so Donald Trump. So they haven't had to figure out exactly what the case against him is because there are so many things that they could say that are some combination of factually true and very appealing to that group. So in some ways, it's, um, it's put woke on the back burner. Like one of the interesting things I've noticed is very few people have gotten canceled lately. Even though everyone is really emotionally wound up, everyone's posting on Twitter all the time, everyone has enough free time to search through everything somebody else has ever said on any medium. And yet the number of people who've actually gotten in trouble for that stuff is surprisingly low. So that's just empirical evidence that woke just matters less, but there are a lot of other political issues that also matter a lot less right now, but will come right back as soon as things get back to normal. So I, I would be, um, I'd be cautious about saying this broke woke in the sense that the non-woke didn't do a great job of, of actually cohesively reacting. So it didn't prove that unwoke wins, it just proved that a subset of unwoke people were right, but also that a set of woke people could feel pretty good about how they behaved relative to some of the other unwoke people. It gets back to filter bubbles. Like everyone, everyone can feel like their side did a good job. Everyone can feel like their views were vindicated, and that means nobody actually won. But everyone's really mad. The other side isn't surrendering. Uh, let's uh, let's transition to oil a little bit. So, so cheap oil is traditionally thought to be bad for governments, but but good for consumers. But with massive demand destruction right now, who is it good for? How should we think about this it's happening at the same time as COVID? And how do we make sense of what's happening? Yeah, I mean, for for an unprecedented move, like literally something suddenly has a negative sign in front of the price. Um, that turned out not to matter nearly as much as, as one might think, because really the, the performance of um, last month's futures contract was more driven by supply, or by, uh, by storage capacity shortages than, than purely by supply demand interaction. So when you buy a barrel of oil, you have the asset, which is the oil, and you have the liability, which is you have to put it somewhere. You can't just dump it in the ocean. Um, 
and on that note, I actually checked briefly because I was um, curious. I wasn't going to do it, but I was curious if it would actually be worth it to buy to get paid thirty-seven dollars a barrel for a whole lot of oil and just dump it somewhere. But it turns out BP paid roughly thirteen thousand dollars a barrel in fines. So um, don't try that one unless things get really bad with the June futures. Um, but yeah, that that those specific price movements in in um, WTI are more related to what's actually going on in physical storage tanks. Um, Brent crude is way down, but not as much. And that seems more, more like something you should just chalk up to demand destruction now and uh, increasingly concerned about storage capacity. So a lot, of, a lot of tankers are getting filled with oil. A number I heard was that 10% of super tankers are just being used for storage. And um, a, lot of, a lot of the storage is getting filled up. Where that gets really interesting and nonlinear is that um, as the, the reason, one of the reasons that oil is such an interesting commodity is that it's historically so cheap to transport that it's by nature a global market. So things that happen in Venezuela, Libya, and Saudi Arabia and Iran matter to consumers around the world and they matter to other oil producers around the world. That's true if there are a lot of tankers and that they're all in use, but as more and more tankers get used for storage rather than transportation, the market actually fragments because now it is meaningfully expensive to move the oil and that cost as a share of the sale price goes up even more. So you'd actually expect to see um, increasing gaps between different kinds of oil in different places, weird gaps in pricing in different regions. And um, that'll cause a lot of disruption because oil demand is um, fairly inelastic with respect to price. It's clearly elastic with respect to things like shutting down the economy for a while. That, that tends to reduce driving a bit. But in terms of price, it's, nobody stops commuting because oil went up. Um, eventually you might lose your job because oil goes up, so consumption goes down, so we go to a recession. But the, the direct effect is just maybe you don't take a road trip, but not that many people do that. So um, right now, oil is cheap oil is um, not as cheap as you'd think from reading headlines about oil futures contracts, but also doesn't really matter because nobody's driving. And at the, the equilibrium will be when more of the lockdowns end, more people start commuting normally and um, production goes down, whether that is um, a pleasant process or a really expensive process of companies that are nearly bankrupt. And um, like the, you could actually imagine a case where a company runs out of cash, can't raise money, and so they can't afford to stop producing oil, in which case it's just this unlimited, uncapped liability. And it's very interesting to think of how that kind of situation would be resolved. Maybe that's the kind of thing you have to buy insurance for if you drill for oil. Maybe maybe there are criminal penalties. I actually don't know what happens because I know that to actually shut in a well, you do have to pay, and um, and to reopen it, you have to pay a lot. And it's possible that since these companies can't really tap capital markets effectively, that um, there could be some companies where the oil is a stranded asset, except it's still coming out of the ground. So it's a stranded liability that keeps on growing. That's that's really interesting. Then you have um, uh, it's not a toxic waste dump in the traditional sense, but it's a ever-growing, slightly toxic waste dump, and we'll have to figure out how to deal with that. That's that's a scenario, though, where the recession remains severe for at least a couple more months, and there's no policy intervention, like just uh, a tweak to the bankruptcy process, where if you if you insist on literally running out of money and not shutting in your wells, that the government will step in and do it for you. Uh, let's close with. Um some macro thoughts on, on, on COVID. What are the second or third order effects of COVID on technology, education, personal relationships, investing that uh, we, we haven't discussed yet today and that uh, might be non-obvious for, for some people? Um, I think a lot of them, there are a lot of obvious effects where it's the duration is the non-obvious part. So there, there will be a burst of divorces and every other marriage is basically permanent. Like you either realize you're incompatible with this person or you realize that if you can get through this, there, there's nothing that should separate you. So that'll be interesting. On the education side, well, we will presumably have a lot more distributed an education system that's both distributed in space where you don't need to go to a classroom, also distributed over time where you will consume more of your education in chunks that you pay for based on stuff you're interested in or that your employer pays for based on stuff that 
you need to know for work. So that'll be that'll be a shift that causes the colleges to, um, to gradually bleed out enrollment and lose prestige um, outside of the elites, and then that can actually start to feed on itself. Where um, once fewer people are getting a degree, it's harder to maintain the degree requirement, and so fewer people try to get a degree. So that part could actually just keep on rolling for a decade or two. Um, beyond that, I think uh, you're going to have a lot more companies that look at worst case scenarios, a lot more institutions looking at worst case scenarios. Like the next infectious disease scare is going to be wild because we had a bunch where people did die and people in the, the country that was experiencing it freaked out and a lot of other people thought it was nothing. So you have um, swine flu, avian flu, MERS, um, and then um, Ebola, and Zika virus. The next time one of those shows up, it's going to be a huge freak out, like the first news story that says novel infection discovered in some, some random country. Dow's gonna, or the S&P, I can't believe I said the Dow. The S&P is gonna drop like 5% on the day. And, um, and then we'll start to learn once again that most of these are not a huge problem and some of them are really huge problems. And because investors are backward looking, but not backward looking all that far, Every, every one of these existential risks will provoke a weaker and weaker reaction until things return to pretty much normal. If you want to get a feel for how that's going to look, um, try going to archive.org or um, other, I guess that'd be the, the only one that would work, and um, look, at the head, look at the front pages of the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, et cetera, in the days after 9-11. There's a lot of freaky stuff. Like, there, there are some incidents that I still do not know the explanation for, like someone disguised as a pilot showed up at either JFK or LGA, and um, as far as I know, the story was just never followed up on. So decent chance that that was just some random thing or a very, very poorly considered prank. But um, there were a lot of bomb scares. There was the wave of anthrax scares a couple of weeks later it really felt like the country was under siege for a while. And it does not feel like the country's under siege, even though there are still people who really hate what we do and would love to crash planes into buildings. If you go back and read through how Al-Qaeda was put together, how it happened, it actually looks a lot more like a fluke. Like there was a point in Bin Laden's life where it seemed like he was a semi-rich playboy who wanted to pretend to be a jihadi, and the actual hardcore guys would hang out with him, not because they thought he was a great leader, but because he would pay for stuff, and so they could basically shake the Bin Laden money tree and then not have to do anything. And then um, somehow he, he actually put together that the, the series of attacks culminating in 9-11. Um, so you know, it, it looked like a fluke. There, there are a lot of those potential flukes that could happen, and they're much more salient after a crisis and then they gradually diminish in importance. So that actually gives you another duration piece, which is six months to a year from now, it may feel like pandemics are a natural feature of modern life because there'll be another one and it'll grow at 20 or 30% a day, just as uh, COVID did, except it'll be on, uh, on front pages nonstop. And then like many of these infections, it will peter out fairly quickly and we'll all breathe a sigh, of, a sigh of relief and the next next incident will get a little less attention and so on and so on. Do you wish this happened until like 4.05 or? Yeah, we could do that. Okay, cool, we have five more minutes. The, um, so uh, any other overrated or underrated as, as it comes to COVID in terms of effects or what you know, people are, 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 are misperceiving or, or you know, and just go back for the stock market for thing for a second. Do, do is, is, is the right question to ask whether it's, um, you know, the recession is, uh, or, or follow-up is, is priced in currently versus, uh, versus it being fed in vision, or is that, is that the wrong question to ask? There are two things that we could be pricing in right now, one of which is V-shaped recovery, um, huge stimulus cu coupled with the fact that all the infrastructure is still here, so we just, the economy just comes roaring back. That's one thing that could be priced in right now. So basically what the market is discounting is bad Q2, bad Q3, and then we're back on track indefinitely thereafter. The other thing the market could be pricing in, which is um, the, the one I've alluded to a little bit, is um, that there will be this share shift from small companies to big companies, that larger multinational tech companies will become more powerful, more prominent, and uh, more embedded in our lives, 
and that the small companies, mom and pop companies will lose their storefronts to chains and will not come back. So in that sense, the, the market is disconnected from the economy because it is actually measuring this increase, not so much in wealth inequality for the people running the big companies, but in power inequality for large companies versus the aggregate power of these smaller institutions. And that's, that's a fairly dark view of the world, but that seems like the direction things will go if small businesses don't get a lot of assistance very quickly. And at this point, that assistance has come. It's come unevenly. There have been delays. It's unclear how much money they need. So um, I don't actually know if we'll get to the point where all of those businesses come back. And if they do, you could, you could definitely have a case where the economy is smaller, but Microsoft and Amazon own more of it, so the stocks go up. Totally. And w one other question I wanted to ask you on, on sort of the concept of, so you, you're you know, part of the progress studies movement. Uh, when, when you talk about sort of the benefits of, 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 of economic growth and people say, yeah, but what about sort of a quality of, of opportunity? How, how do you sort of think about that term and how to sort of, um, you know, because as economic growth increases, that seems to decrease in some sense. Well, I, I, but I almost see equality of opportunity as sort of a, um, basically a substitute for equality of outcome in some sense, because as, you know, because, you know, because of parents, because of genes, because of neighborhoods, as sort of wealth increases uh, and inequality increases with it, equality of opportunity also uh, you know, decreases as a result. How, how do you think about what I'm saying or that, that term more broadly? I wonder, should we use it more like sufficient prosperity or some other term that's not, maybe not as romantic? Yeah, so there's an interesting shift where traditionally the U.S. political dialogue was that the right says they want equality of opportunity and they sort of want something very much like that, but you can critique it. And then the view of the left is they want equality of outcome, although they will frame it as we want equality of opportunity. It just turns out that the way that we thought about equalizing those opportunities tends to look a whole lot like it's designed its, its success is measured based on equality of outcome, or yeah, equality of outcome. Like one, it, some, in some ways it's a definitional question of on the right, they think that given equality of opportunity, you should have very unequal outcomes because people are different. And then on the left, they think that um, everyone has potential and everyone can achieve wonderful things and self-actualization and um, all of these, all these great things. So by definition, you measure your quality of uh, opportunity by whether or not the outcomes end up equal. And then you can make a more libertarian or Austrian critique of that where the, the knowledge that you need to measure that equality is not easily available. It's extremely hard to measure. You can even see that in things like when companies try to use machine learning to improve and de-bias their hiring, and they end up with really weird statistical results like um, you should hire someone who plays field hockey. Like that, was, that was something the Amazon, I think it was field hockey, that was something the Amazon algorithm um, produced when they ran machine learning on resumes. Now the weird thing about that story is um, that the coverage was really unclear as to whether what the model was doing was predicting probability of being hired conditional on having those words in the resume or probability of getting good performance reviews conditional on getting hired and having those words in the resume. And that's an important distinction because it tells you the opposite things. So if, if there is some sport that correlates really highly with getting hired, then it tells you that there is bias in favor of that sport. If there's some sport that, tell, that correlates really highly with getting good performance reviews conditional on getting hired, that actually tells you there's bias against people who play that sport. So a lot of that thinking is um, really hard to, hard to execute because you have to think about range restriction, you have to think about what, is, what are you sampling from and how much data do you have and what are you missing from the things you don't sample from. This is actually something we're all getting an education in as we track the spread of COVID-19 because you can look at things like Japan's strategy where they test clusters, but if half the people are asymptomatic and the average person spreads it to more than two people, then um, there is an epidemic of asymptomatic carriers who Japan, by policy, wasn't testing. So, of course, it's going to get bad. Like, we've, we've learned a lot about selection effects very, very quickly from, from this, and we will hopefully apply that knowledge across other domains. But getting back to the political shift, um, a lot of a lot of the way that big business has evolved in the U.S. has been towards 
more global businesses towards more tech companies. And um, those companies just intrinsically exaggerate any difference in ability or skill or luck to the extreme because now the global market is 7 billion people instead of a US market of 300 million. So if you get really lucky and you sell something to everybody, your unit cost is low and you sell 20 times as many units, then you do 20 times as well as you would have done before. So the 0.01% is 20x as rich. That's like the, the schematic, very stylized, exaggerated version of what's going on, but it's directionally true. And then the question is, how do you how do you deal with that? Like we, if one of the ways to get very, very wealthy is to create some kind of monopoly. And these monopolies lead to things people like, such as Zoom or Facebook, the product, like the single most popular thing to do on the internet, or Google, the way to get all the information you want, or Amazon to get all of the tangible goods that you want rather than informational goods that you want. Um, like These are all things that seem to make the world a better place, and they also seem to make the world a more unequal place. So if you want to celebrate those kinds of businesses and you want to encourage more of them to exist, and ideally more of them to exist in this country, and you don't want a revolution from a lot of people losing their jobs because their jobs get automated away by these wonderful products, then the, the conservative outcome is to actually aim for more equality of outcome, um, at least in terms of consumption and how you spend, how you're able to spend your time. So if you look at something like um, economic nationalism, like tariffs and lower immigration, one way to view that is that it is basically a subsidy for less skilled labor in the US, where if the, if the advantage of outsourcing is that labor costs are lower, a sufficiently high tariff eliminates that labor cost advantage, so you don't outsource, and that is tantamount to taxing the consumer in the aggregate in order to subsidize the workers who are most directly competing with factory workers in other countries, and those workers are necessarily going to be categorized as less skilled workers. So it is a conservative welfare program, but it is conservative um, both in the sense that the people who advocate it call themselves conservative right now, and in the sense that it is advocating conserving, A, the U.S. industrial base, so it's conservative in that it's telling us to do something we already like to do, and B, it is trying to line up um, economic rewards with effort. It's trying to make sure that there are actually jobs available for people, and so it's treating access to jobs rather than access to stuff as what people really want. So it, it does come back to the question of who wins that intra-Republican struggle between the sort of donor establishment Republicans who would have preferred Jeb, but now they're really rah-rah about Trump, but they're not Trumpists, so they're sort of rah-rah about whatever it is that Trump believes at the moment versus the actual Trumpists. I would note that the, the Trumpists are a much smaller cohort, but they're younger, so demographics are on their side. Um, they're, they're super articulate too, so they actually have a belief system rather than having more of a set of talking points. And um, so they're, they're fighting a downhill battle, but they are very outnumbered. It'll be interesting to see how that ends. That's a perfect place to, to wrap. My guest today has been Bern Hobart. Uh, if you liked what you heard, uh, uh, even if you didn't, uh, check out diff.substack.com. It's a fantastic newsletter. Uh, and Bern, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. It was great. Thanks. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Check us out at villageglobal.vc.